346 people. So I'm joined now by Owen Corrie, editor of Travel Extra. Afternoon, Owen. Um, so the the news had this week was about Qantas and the grounding of one of their planes. But uh, frighteningly, Qantas is not the only one who found cracks in their Boeing planes. Is that yeah, right? The, the phrase "how's the crack" is not being used Good God. Uh, yeah. <laughs> liberally in Seattle as we speak. September, end of September, um, the crack um, started appearing. Um, the, the first cracks were were detected, and the alert went out worldwide. The um, seven three seven NG, as opposed to the um, the Max, which everybody's been talking about for for a long, long time, which has been grounded. Um, it's a previous generation aircraft is no longer in production and there is a novel out of them out there so airlines were told uh, have a look at this um, it's not an insubstantial part of the aircraft it's the one that holds the fuselage onto the wing which is something that you do not want to disconnect in mid-flight no incidents but um, cracking is something that regulators aviation regulators uh, take a dim view of and um, it's a simple enough check it takes about an hour to do but there are questions as to how what you do next? Do you need to uh, replace, or um, what are the um, um, what are the options for repairing? And uh, replacement seems to be the main option now. Different airlines have flagged, um, or not even flagged, because it's not something you want to do. Alert everyone to. But Qantas um, this week brought it more or less to world attention. Everybody sat up and took notice. Uh, what's the what's the crack? Is the phrase? Um, we there isn't according to the. Either Boeing or the airlines involved uh, an Im- immediate danger to uh, passengers, but a, wh- what uh, the regulators want to know is what is the level of danger. And initially, the cracks were found in very late in a life in the life cycle of an aircraft. Now they're showing up uh, considerably earlier. Um, not exactly a new aircraft, but people are uh, um, the. Air, the airlines that are finding the cracks are grounding the aircraft as they find them. So obviously in the wake of, of the uh, 737 MAX, this is turning into a nightmare for Boeing, isn't Existential it? Existential crisis. The only thing that's saving uh, Bo- it being a bigger crisis for Boeing is there is no alternative. We have two uh, people who ma- manufacture aircraft, Airbus and Boeing, uh, in that particular market, the most popular end of the market, 180 seats in an aircraft. It's the 737 for Boeing. It's the A320 for Airbus. Airbus's uh, order book are fill, full for four years. Boeing uh, obviously can't, uh, they can manufacture, but they can't uh, put any of their aircraft in the air. So we are facing a situation with only two suppliers and one of them uh, being crippled with the inability to deliver aircraft. Uh, the whole aviation market is... Um, in crisis and the only thing saving uh, preventing this being an existential crisis for Boeing is the fact there are no alternatives Good God are there Irish planes affected? And Boeing's uh, uh, Ryanair is an entirely a Boeing 737 airline. All of their aircraft are Boeing 737s, and they have been uh, responding to the alert to look out for this particular crack. So, are, are Ryanair telling us they've checked all their planes? And um, I, uh, I, they, I'm not sure if they've checked all of their aircraft, but, but Ryanair are very quick to respond to this, okay. and will uh, as the airline, uh, as the air, it's not even waiting for the aircraft to come into service. They are being checked. I see, I don't know if you saw this, I see Willie Walsh in the Business Post today, who, uh, Willie Walsh, originally a pilot, Absolutely. saying that he has flown a simulator of the 737 MAX and he has absolute confidence in it now. Are, are, are Boeing managing to move past the 737 MAX crisis? It's a difficult one to move past, Brendan, for a couple of reasons. One of them being that, they, to, to explain exactly what happened with the MAX, was it was a, a really a, quite a different uh, aircraft from the predecessors in that the engines were a little bit heavier a little bit further forward so the simulation that worked for previous uh, versions um, wasn't really uh, didn't really apply so they installed this software system to overcome the difference and the software system is what caused the two crashes that's what pretty much uh, has been identified so what Boeing apparently tried to do was bring a, effect, a new type of aircraft to the market without calling it that because of the training costs and the fact that um, pilots all over the world would have to retrain and re-simulate. 
what they've been doing since is saying we'll get over the we'll fix the software and they haven't come out clean on whether it'll involve retraining all the pilots but they have been building simulators which are specifically uh, built for the max and Bo- uh, Willie Walsh is not the first supportive word uh, he's made for Boeing he came out at the uh, Paris Air Show he ordered uh, and uh, already produced he put his money where his mouth was and he ordered several of the 737 max for when it gets back in the air um, quite common to find avi- the airlines around the world being more confident about the 737 MAX getting back in the air than the regulators. And the second big issue is the breach of trust, and there's no other word for it, uh, between the regulators and Boeing. It looks at this stage that Boeing were effectively self-certifying their aircraft for the US regulators, and the world's regulators were following the lead of the US. The US were the last to ground them, even Canada, and the, the that breach of trust trust is it's it, that would be very very interesting to see how it repairs okay. if the u.s certify it to refly how long will it be before the other regulators do okay and ryanair did release a statement on thursday saying they're continuing to review its aircraft in line with the aad and does not expect it to have any impact on our operations or fleet availability i'm um, on to go back to Qantas. so they recently launched the world's longest flight this was a 20-hour flight <coughs> excuse me from sydney to new york now you've done the 17 hour Perth to London. Yeah, they they brought 20 they brought 50 people on the 20 hour flight and it was under test conditions. The longest it's a part of Alan Joyce um is from Tala. He is uh, the CEO, CEO of uh, Qantas getting uh, married this weekend. I absolutely mm-hmm. getting married. Uh, he says it's one of the most expensive weddings in uh, the history of any man from Tala <laughs> because he put millions into the um equality marriage equality campaign in Ireland and more millions okay. more in Australia so okay. it's cost him a lot of money but uh, he has um, this is a flagship of his his very successful tenure he's turned it from being a basket case financially to being a very profitable airline and he says that uh, Project Sunrise getting direct flights to Europe. He talked about it 10 years ago when it was sort of a pipe dream, but the technology has moved on now. And he has uh, launched London to Perth, which is the one I went on. And he is testing, he's testing uh, Sydney to New York and Sydney to London. The things they will be looking at will be particularly the pilots. The pilots wear helmets, which measure every single uh, brainwave, every single thought <laughs> on the pilot's head as he, as he flies for... Uh, for and the, I believe the passengers had to get up and do exercise as any of the medical people listening will know is the big uh, concern it's already a concern for long haul flights I did the 17 hours, I loved it I expected it to be an ordeal um, one of the things that happened was uh, one of the things that are a little bit different is the humidity of the cabin was increased a little bit it's a little bit damper, a little bit more uh, uncomfortable while you're flying but that takes the dryness a bit sweaty you're saying that's, a bit yeah, sweaty. Okay. that's the, no. That's I'm sure phrase, that's the phrase they use in court. I'm sure you were walking in the right direction when you when you got on that plane on, were you? Well, um, okay, I did talk to the people who weren't turning left, right? Yeah. <laughs> and it is it is a fabulous fabulous flight. Um, it, the people that I met, particularly, I was very interested in the Irish ones doing that little connection back to Ireland with children. Um, they were all they all held it up. Uh, they all thought it was a great flight. The children had liked it. They big issue is um, that getting to Australia effectively is a 14 hour flight um, from the from the Middle East and we have three main hub points there uh, Doha, Dubai, Abu Dhabi and it's an 8 hour flight to the Middle East from here so you're waking up children at a particular the difficult time during the journey and they said they prefer 17 hours, one hop London to Perth and then your connection you're, you have 21 flights a day back from uh, London to Dublin and uh, similar okay. to Cork so it gives you more options if the flight's slightly delayed. So good thumbs up all around for that 17-hour flight, and I don't expect the 20-hour flight to be any different. Brian, you, you um, probably for a good chunk of your life were flying back and forth quite regularly. That was only to Brussels and yeah. uh, Strasbourg. It was an hour, an hour and 20 minutes. You mentioned Alan, um, who, who's a, such an inspirational person, you know, Tala Community School, from Dublin 24, now the CEO of Qantas. He spoke, yeah, he spoke um, recently at the 
Dublin Chamber. Uh, Dublin Chamber. I was out at the AIB and Dublin Chamber of Commerce, yeah. uh, and he was inspirational in terms of his outlook. So, I mean, what is it about Irish people and CEOs? I mean, we have Qantas, <laughs> Willie Walsh, <laughs> Michael O'Leary. Michael O'Leary. What is it about the, um, the Irish in aviation? Uh, it's an extraordinary achievement. We've always been country. good at a flyer. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 To, to, answer, to answer your question, it's our location. We, you know, yeah. most of uh, the early history of aviation was transatlantic. And because the early aircraft couldn't make it beyond Ireland, the likes of Tony Ryan, station master's yeah. son, would have been very aware of what was happening. Everything was stopping in China. Ryan was instrumental, wasn't he, actually? Uh, the, whole yeah. the, the, the leasing industry, 30% of the aircraft in the sky are leased out of Ireland. He was the man who started, kick-started yeah. that. So we ended up with, you know, when people looked around for an industry that we could perform in, we didn't do coal mining, we didn't do merchant banking, all of that, but aircraft were part of Irish life from a, and lots of people worked as engineers they don't because it's engineers Alan's um, it's, uh, was the first person not just in his family not just to go to third level but to actually finish second level in, yeah. in his family and here he is yeah, running a major aviation industry the, the longest and, flight I've ever Alison. been on was 12 hours and I got drunk and sobered up three times <laughs> <laughs> so, so I can't imagine what I'd be doing on a 17 hour one I'm not sure that there's enough drink on it to keep me there for 17 well, that passed away the 12 hours <laughs> 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 anyway. and, and it has to be said early in this was the, a clearing house it was a, an educational it was almost a, a, an MBA of aviation a lot of these guys okay. went through Aer Lingus and went on to um, Asia X uh, Air Asia X in Kuala Lumpur was effectively set up by Conor McCarthy so all of these guys learned the ropes in Aer Lingus Aer Lingus very very highly rated internationally highly uh, one of the two brands that was mentioned in the Simpsons that came from Ireland the other being Guinness that shows you <laughs> how powerful they are so we really have a history of not just um, looking to the air and being conscious of aviation, mm. but having the facility to learn the ropes at home and bring our skills around the world. Okay, just to bring it back down to earth for a second, this weekend <laughs> on no, is the changing of the aviation season. So what what will that mean for Irish flyers? Uh, winter used to mean um, we got the Canaries and Morocco, and that was our only sun options. But um, what we've what uh, happens is most people fly during summer. Uh, airlines make money during summer. They lose money during winter. They cut down the routes to the bare minimum. What we've been seeing in the last three or four years is routes being uh, tried out during winter, uh, mainly the city routes, the likes of Dublin Billund, which uh, is starting this week, uh, Cork, uh, Katowice from uh, Ryanair. And we are seeing um, uh, some of the, a lot of the seasonal routes, for an example, would be Dublin, Sevilla in uh, Spain, which would have closed down in October, being continued through winter. So while we have a, the winter schedules take over, the options that are out there are much larger and much greater than they were before. And the Malaga and Faro routes, which would have been seasonal in years, are absolutely booming during winter, fall of people, you, particularly people who don't not confined by school holidays, um, about um, taking advantage of it. Big loss, though, um, our Dublin Agadir service, which was twice weekly, is it, are suddenly closing down November the 2nd to the extent that people who had booked on future flights are bit, have to be refunded. Okay. And that's a big loss for us. Okay, Owen Corey, thank you very much.